Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Great. Go ahead and share with the class which method you chose to solve the first system, number one, when I call on you. So go ahead and tell the class which method you use to solve that first system when I call on you. So which method you use for that, Hannah? Substitution. Raise your hand if you use the same method as Hannah. Substitution? Yeah, I would too. It looks like that second equation is already solved for one of the variables, in this case x. So it's all ready to solve by substitution. So I can go ahead and rewrite. I can go ahead and rewrite that first equation. Except everywhere I see an x, I'm not going to put x. I'm going to put 3y plus 9. What x equals? And so that will allow us to get a single equation with a single variable. So in for x goes 3y plus 9. Now we can go ahead and solve the single equation, single variable, just y is in it. We can do that. Distributing gets us rid of the parentheses. Combining like terms, same side, same operation, gets a single y term. Subtraction gets y alone on one side. Could be negative 40 for there. Is that right? Negative 40. Awesome. And then division finishes it off. It looks like I get y equals negative 2. The nice thing about substitution method, if I have one of those equations solved for one of the variables, once I get one coordinate, in this case y equals negative 2, I can go right back to that asterisk equation and rewrite it and figure out what x is based on y being negative 2. So that would be 3 times y plus 9. It looks like y was negative 2. So 3 times negative 2 is negative 6, plus 9 is 3, so I'm getting x equals 3. And we'll go ahead and box my potential solution point as 3, comma, negative 2. Before I box it, though, I want to make sure I'm checking in the original and see if, if that is, in fact, correct. And so I'm going to go ahead and go to the original, and I'm going to plug in 3 everywhere I see an x. I'm going to plug in negative 2 everywhere I see a y and see if it makes a true statement. So let's go ahead and check. 8 times 3 is 24. Minus 4 times negative 2 is plus 8. Does 24 plus 8 equal question mark 32? Yes, it does. Does 3 equal 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 plus 9? Yes, negative 6 plus 9 does equal 3. And so both of those are satisfied. And I'll box it because I'm confident that is correct. Raise your hand if you already had 3 negative 2 for the solution to the number 1 system. Yes. Way to go, you guys. So your rock sound substitution to the top. That's awesome. What method would you use to solve number two? All right, would substitution be the way to go with number two? Emily? Uh, I elimination. Elimination. Raise your hand if you use the same method as Emily. Elimination. Elimination. Good. And what would be your strategy then to use the elimination method number two? What would you first do so that we could eliminate a variable? Caroline? Um, multiply the first equation by negative two. Multiply the first equation by negative two. Let's see. That would then... Make exact opposites in the x term, absolutely, I'm down. So I'm going to do the same thing, thank you. So I'm going to multiply the top equation all the way through, both sides by negative 2 and rewrite. So I get negative 6x plus 14y equals negative 20, watch your signs. The second equation, rewritten as is, no change, just rewriting it, so then I'm all set to add. <coughs> I see that I have created exact opposites in the x's, thanks to your guys' help, so I'll add top to bottom. Here we go. Negative 6x plus 6x, 0. Positive 14y minus 8y is 6y. Negative 20 plus 8 is negative 12. It looks like I can solve this by division and get y coordinate equals negative 2. Now I can go back to either of the original equations. It doesn't matter which because this, this solution must satisfy both equations, right? It has to satisfy every equation there, so it doesn't matter which one I pick. If one looks easier than the other, I'll use it, but they look about the same to me. Maybe I'll pick the first one because it's got lower x value. 3 times, I'm sorry, lower coefficient. 3 times, whoops, 3 times x, we still don't know what it is. 3 times x. Minus 7 times y that we just found equals 10. And we found that y was negative 2. So 3x plus 14 equals 10. Subtraction yields 3x equals negative 4. And division gets me x equals negative 4 thirds. 
So there we have it. We've run into, yes, that's right, the F word, fraction, already. And it's, it's early, right? It's not even lunchtime yet. Except this may, right, in fact, be a solution. Just because we get a fractional value doesn't mean that we have an incorrect answer. We can still check and see in the original. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at my potential solution point. Negative 4 thirds, comma, negative 2. And before boxing it, I'll go ahead and investigate the original system and see if when substituting in, I get a true statement. So here we go. <laughs> Three times negative four thirds, negative four. Minus seven times negative two is plus 14. Negative four plus 14, is that 10? Here it is. Six times negative four thirds is going to be <coughs> negative two times four is negative 8. Negative 8 plus 16, does that equal positive 8? Yes, it does. So I'm confident in my answer. Raise your hand if you had negative 4 thirds, comma, negative 2 already. Anyone else get that, that fractional answer? Way to go. You guys are doing great. What questions do you have about today's bar? Okay. Then we'll go ahead and pause our recording now so that we can check our assignment number 2. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to use matrices to represent data, to represent polygons in the XY coordinate plane. We're going to add, subtract, and find scalar multiples of matrices. So there's our performing operations with matrices. We'll recognize some properties uh, of matrix operations, and we'll use matrix addition and scalar multiplication to solve real world problems. And so we might be wondering what is a matrix if we're going to do all this stuff with matrices? Well, a matrix is simply a rectangular arrangement of objects or numbers. So we're going to use a matrix to store data or to represent right, data. And it's like a trimmed down version of a chart that you might encounter like in social studies. Uh, a graph, a chart, or table. Well, a matrix is a rectangular arrangement of objects or numbers. So we could consider our seating chart here as a matrix. Suppose that the seats in this room are set up in our rectangular arrangement of four rows and eight columns. Is that right? And so let's take a look. So four rows, everybody think where you are. Row one, two, three, four. So four rows and then eight columns. How do we do? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is a great way to think about the dimensions of matrices because rows are horizontal. And we have one, two, three, four versus columns, right? Columns are vertical. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight columns. We name a matrix based on its dimensions. Row by column. So we have a four by eight matrix. <clears throat> what I want you to do is think for a minute, and who would be sitting in the second row from the front, third column from the door? So let's uh, take a minute and now see who is sitting in the second row from the front, third column from the door. Everybody found, found her? Okay, so who is it? Ian? Cody is, right? You win. Oh my gosh, you win. What did she win? You win. A lifesaver. There you go. Congratulations. Hey. Everybody, but but not just Cody's a winner, everybody's a winner. So we rate we we name a matrix now by the number of rows by the number of columns. Okay, the number of rows by the number of columns. So in this rectangular arrangement of numbers, this is a matrix, right? You can see that it has this one has three rows and three columns. Uh, this matrix, right, has two rows and three columns, right? Rows go horizontally and columns go vertically. And so since there's two rows, you can see those rows are 2, negative 5, 10. We go in order from left to right. Negative 4, 19, and 4 is the second row. So there's three columns. You can see those highlighted in purple. This would be a 2 by 3 matrix. Why? Because we always do number of rows by number of columns when we talk about the size. Now, why do we care so much? Well, because we can only perform operations with matrices based on their dimensions. And the dimensions are important depending upon what operation we're going to be performing. So we always name our dimensions of a matrix based on rows by columns. Uh-oh.
So if our dimension grabs go number of rows by number of columns. So for us, this would be what size matrix? It would be one, two rows by one, two, three columns. This is a two by three matrix. And so the dimensions of this matrix are a two by three matrix. Good. All right. So when we store facts in a matrix, we use the following notation in language. The data is stored in a rectangular pattern of rows and columns. A large square bracket is used to enclose the data. When we talk about the dimension, we name the number of rows first, then the number of columns. An element of a matrix is a specific object stored in one of the cells in the matrix, kind of like a spreadsheet. If we think about each entry, right, each entry being the cell of a spreadsheet, then the member of that cell is called an element. And that's, again, it's just vocabulary. It's the vocabulary that we use so we have a common foundation to discuss matrices. Matrices are equal if and only if they have the same exact same dimension and each element is exactly the same. All right, let's go ahead and see then how we can use a matrix to represent data. Suppose the matrix I write shows the median yearly income for men and women by educational level for the year 2000. Everybody find this matrix on your note sheet. Where are the dimensions of this matrix? So keep in mind we name dimensions row by column. So we <coughs> determine the dimensions and be ready to share with the whole class. Consider the dimensions of this matrix, number of rows by number of columns. What size matrix would this be? Nathan? Four by two. Four by two. Raise your hand if you have the same as Nathan. Four by two is correct. One, two, three, four rows, right? And then by one, two columns. Four by two, good. What entry is in row one, column two? Everybody find it. Row one, column two. What's the entry? Row one, column two. Taylor? Uh, $17,209. Good. $17,209 is the row one, column two entry. And lastly, what does 30,178 represent, right, in this matrix? What does that represent in the real world context? Everybody decide. So what does that 30,178 represent in context of this matrix. Mark? Um, the yearly income of, or like the average yearly income of the bachelor degrees in the year 2000. Was the 30,000 for uh, 178, was that for a bachelor's degree? Oh, associate degree. Associate degree. And so that is the median. And, that, and that's similar but different. I right? remember median yearly income. Median is the middle, the middle, the middle member of a data set if you arrange it in increasing order from least to greatest or greatest to least, the middle one would be median. Oftentimes when you're dealing with large number of statistics, we'll often choose median as a measure of central tendency as opposed to, uh, as opposed to mean the average, just because sometimes there's a few, a few people that earn an insane amount of money that would pull the average up higher, right? Then is it would make it not really a fair representation of what sort of the middle, the middle income is. And so we use median oftentimes to represent sort of that that middle uh, measure of the central tendency. And so the median yearly income of a woman with an associate's degree in the year 2000 was thirty thousand one hundred seventy-eight dollars. Good job. Got it off. All right, let's go ahead and organize the following data into a matrix. We're going to be sure and label our rows and columns. So everybody, let's consider this problem situation. In 1990, total energy consumption in the United States was 338.4 BTU per person. And in China, it was 23.5 BTU per person. I'm, I know BTW, right, when I'm, when I'm texting. Right, back and forth with my wife during class all the time. Right, BTW. What's BTU represent? What does BTU represent? 
Anybody recognize that unit? BTU? BTU stands for British Thermal Unit. It's just a way of measuring energy. Well, we're used to measuring in the SI with joules, right? Joules is the unit that, that measures energy quantitatively. Well, BTU is just a different unit to, to use for energy. So BTU is British Thermal Unit. Um, in 2000, consumption was 350.6 and 29.5 respectively. Uh, respectively, and in 2340.5 and 51 BTU per person. Let's store these data in a 3 by 2 matrix. Okay, guys, if we're going to store this data in a 3 by 2 matrix, we need to decide what is going to be the rows and what is going to be the columns. In our last example, our rows were level of education, our columns were men versus women. Go ahead and decide with your partner, and I want you to talk. Go ahead and decide what would your rows be here and your columns be here in order to get three by two for the dimensions. Right. Okay. So to make this fit in a 3 by 2 matrix, what are we going to have to choose to be our row designation versus what are we going to have to choose to be our column designation? Please share with the whole class when I call on you. Uh, Aaron and Will? The rows would be the years and the columns would be the places. The rows would be the years and the columns would be the, the places, the countries. Raise your hand if you have the same designation. The same designation is great. Thank you. That's perfect, Aaron. So let's go ahead and do our... Uh, our years, so we want 90, 1990, we want the year 2000 and 2005. So let's go ahead and label our, our, uh, our rows. We've got 1990, we've got 2000, and we've got 2005. Then our columns were the places, and so we've got United States and China. So we have United States and China. Now that we have our rows and column designation, we can go ahead and organize our data into the matrix. So we'll go ahead and organize our data now into the matrix. <coughs> Looks like 1990 United States Energy consumption was 338.4 BTU per person, so we just do the 338.4. China, 23.5. So in the year 2000, we're up to 350.6. And 29.5. And in 2005, looks like 340.5. And... 1.4. And so while it looks like the United States had a slight increase and then decrease to get right back in the 15-year period almost to where it was in 1990, it appears as though China is definitely on the rise in this given 15-year cycle. Do you guys see that? All the way from 23.5 to almost double in that 15 years. Uh, interesting. And we've seen some serious industrialization occurring in China over the last two decades. So that can help explain uh, this kind of on the precursor of that. Awesome. Could we have arranged this in a 2 by 3 matrix instead? Could we have done a 2 by 3 matrix? Go ahead and tell your partner why or why not. Okay, what is this going to do? 2 by 3? Yeah, yeah. Taylor and Jared, what did you guys say? We said yes because we did so many years on the side and then uh, we on the top and then uh, um, places on the side. Oh, right, because then two two rows, so places U.S. China would be our two rows, and then three for the second number is columns. That would be then the years 1990, 2000, 2005. Absolutely, thank you, you guys. Um, so doesn't matter which dimension we choose. Who cares? Well, it does matter if we're going to perform operations with matrices. And so in order to perform like addition or subtraction with two different matrices, they have to have exactly the same dimension. And so we can only multiple, I'm sorry, we can only add a two by three matrix with other two by three matrices. Uh, matrices. 
we can only add or subtract a three by two matrix with other three by two matrices. And so they must have the same dimensions if we're going to be performing operations of addition or subtraction. All right. Next, let's go ahead and see how matrices could represent polygons in the xy coordinate plane. And so in the uh, xy coordinate plane, a point x comma y could be represented by this two row single column matrix where my top number is my x coordinate, the bottom number is the y coordinate. We then connect the points in order, starting from the first and going in order, right, from left to right uh, chronologically. So let's go ahead and start at my first point. My first point would be the first column. Row 1, column 1, has the number 3. That means the x coordinate of the first point is 3. Row 2, column 1, tells me the corresponding y coordinate. So see this x comma y, that's going to be 3 comma 1. Everybody, let's plot that. So 3 comma 1 would be my first point. My next point would be 0 comma 7. So everybody plot 0 comma 7, that would be my next point. Tell the class the third point in order as I go to construct this, this polygon. Rachel? Um, negative 5, 5. Negative 5, 5, thank you. My next point, Joe? Negative 1, negative 1. Negative 1, negative 1. Okay, guys. But this is the strangest looking polygon, right, uh, that I've ever seen because it's not. In order to be a polygon, right, that's a straight-sided figure. And so let's start at our first point. And we need to connect them in the order represented in my matrix. So I started the first point was 3, comma 1. And I go in order, straight sides. It looks like I need to go from 3, 1 to 0, 7 first. So 3, 1 to 0, 7 first. And then I need to go to negative 5, 5. And then I need to go to negative 1, negative 1. And then back. That's pretty sweet. Hey, it's a hot pink polygon. Is it hot pink? Whatever. It's Friday. I'll enjoy it. Daily. Awesome. What questions do you have about representing polygons with matrices? So it's just x comma y, top number, bottom number, x comma y, respectively. All right, now let's get to our operations. And so now that we've seen right matrices and we use them to represent data, whether it's from a polygon or uh, from a data like like uh, a chart, we're now going to go ahead and add matrices, subtract matrices, and then multiply a matrix by a, a constant. That's called scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication. The operations follow patterns that we would expect to see. And so that's the good news. That's why we have our celebratory balloons there. Because when we add two matrices together, we'll simply combine the corresponding elements. So like the row 2, column 3 entry will be added with the row 2, column 3 entry in the other matrix. And so let's go ahead and see what that looks like. In order to add or subtract matrices, we must have matrices of the same dimension. And we simply combine the corresponding elements. It's that easy. So let's suppose that companies A and B merge. The total number of employees at each company before the merger is given in matrices A and B below. We're going to go ahead and find a new matrix called matrix C that's the sum of matrix A and matrix B, and we'll explain what C represents. So let's go ahead and find the elements of matrix C simply by adding matrix A plus matrix B. How do we do that? Well, it's easy. We'll go ahead and find the row 1, column 1 entry in matrix A, that looks like full-time management positions, and combine it with, through addition, the corresponding 1-1 one, one entry in matrix B. That is full-time management positions. So you guessed it, 12 plus 28 equals 40, my row 1, column 1 entry in matrix C, my new matrix. So everybody go ahead and do that. I know that my full-time administrative positions for matrix A plus my full-time administrative Positions from matrix B are added together, so it looks like 15 plus 33 is 48. Are you guys getting 48? And you guessed it, our full-time manufacturing position, 7 plus 125, that will be my row 1, column 3 entry, so what's that? 132, are you guys getting 132? Go ahead and finish it out. Go ahead and finish it out. part-time management 
part-time administrator. Part-time manufacturing. Raise your hand if you have the same matrix C that I had. You ever have the same entries? Yes? Great work. Okay, so you simply combine corresponding elements through addition or subtraction in the order specified. Now let's go ahead and interpret what C represents. So what would C represent? Go ahead and tell your partner. What have we just found? What's that? 40, 48, 132, 4, 12, 10. So what is it that matrix C represents? In other words, what have we found by doing that matrix addition, matrix A plus matrix B? What does that represent? Um, Kenzie and Caroline? Um, like the, the employees of company A and company B together. Yeah, it looks like the total number of employees as a result of the merger designated by status, right, by time, status, and type. Uh, so how can we say that? Well, we could say um, total number of employees by type and time designation. And by type, I mean management versus administrative versus manufacturing. And time designation is full-time versus part-time. Awesome. So that's the total number of employees now in my new company, right? In my new company, C. Great. Scalar multiplication, right? is when I take a, uh, a number and I multiply it by a matrix. Now I can do this just like we do uh, the distributed property. When we take an outside factor and multiply through parentheses in an algebraic expression, we can do the same thing with a matrix expression. I'll simply distribute that value 3 to every entry inside, just like I have to go term by term and multiply to every term inside the parentheses. It's just now I'm inside the brackets for a matrix. So guess what? It's exactly as you'd expect. I'll do 3 times 7 is 21. 3 times 8 is 24. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. We'll simply distribute that 3 to everybody. Go ahead and finish it out. We know our square brackets are used to designate right, the boundaries of our matrix. Go ahead and tell the class the dimensions of this matrix when I call on you. So what's the dimensions of this resulting matrix? Be ready to share with the class when I call on you. Look, dimensions of this matrix. Samantha? Two by three. Two by three. Raise your hand if you were going to say two by three. But I didn't call on you, but I was going to call on you, but I'm going to call on you next time. Good job. Thank you. So this is a two by three because row by columns. Two rows and three columns. Strong work, you guys. All right. So some questions to ponder. When you add or subtract matrices, what are the dimensions of the answer matrix? So when we add or subtract matrices, what are the dimensions of the answer matrix? Well, let's see. We added that 2 by 3 plus this 2 by 3 equaled a 2 by 3. So same dimensions. We can go ahead and include that as our response. So same dimensions as the originals. Is addition of matrices commutative? What? What in the world does commutative mean? What in the world does commutative mean? Well, commutative means does order matter. And so would our addition A plus B for those two companies have been the same as the addition B plus A if we had switched the order? So does A plus B equal question mark? B plus A. Well, let's go back to that merger question. Would we have gotten a different resulting matrix C if we had done B plus A? Ian? No. No, we would have had the same answer. And so is addition of matrices commutative? Yes, it is. When you multiply a 3 by 4 matrix by K, what are the dimensions of your answer matrix? 
So when we're multiplying by some constant k, did that change the dimensions of my original? No, we still got a, Samantha told us 2 by 3, so we'd still expect a 3 by 4. That is, the dimensions remain unchanged as a result of scalar multiplication. That's just multiplying by some constant. And lastly, is scalar multiplication commutative? So scalar multiplication, would it have mattered if we did the 3 times the matrix or the matrix times 3? No, just like the distributive property, we could have had the 3 on the back side of the matrix and then multiplied in, just like we did with our factor multiplication in unit 5 and 6. And so, yes, scalar multiplication is commutative as well. So what's not commutative? Well, a couple different things. Firstly, subtraction, right? Subtraction would be a red flag. If we went ahead and took matrix A and subtracted off matrix B, that would have made a big difference. Now we would have been in the negative values, in the negative number of employees. You see that? 12 minus 28 would have been a negative value. 15 minus 33 would have been a negative value. Reverse that order of operation and say, what if we did matrix B minus A? If I did matrix B minus A, then 28 minus 12, that would have been a positive value 16. And so, what does matter? Matrix order uh, for subtraction definitely matters. And so, subtraction of matrices is not commutative. And I'm going to add that. Everybody add that because you'll run into that in your assignment and on the next on the next quiz. So subtraction is not commutative. That is order matters. So subtraction is not commutative. That is order matters. B minus A does not equal A minus B in general. Awesome. Okay. So who cares? All right. Why do we talk about matrices? What are matrices good for? Well, matrices... Right? Strip large amount of information down to the bare essentials. We saw that we had that big paragraph about the United States versus uh, the China energy consumption per person, and we could represent it in this nice, handsome, three by two carrying case. Right? And so the first use of matrices is stripping down large amounts of information down to the bare essentials. Secondly, matrices can also be used for a variety of real life applications, including business, probability, area, and solving linear systems. So matrices are used uh, particularly with computer programming. Computers use matrices to solve any linear system, and that's what we're going to use matrices for next class, no matter how many variables, by using systematic row operation. And so computers use matrices to solve any linear system. Uh, it could be three by, it could be three equations, three variables. It could be 20 equations, 20 variables. So we have a huge system, right, instead of just a little X's and Y's. We could have X, Y, Z, T, U, V, whatever, six by six matrix, and we're going to be able to use our graphing calculators to solve it next class, and so I'm pretty excited about that. All right, so let's go ahead and take care of our closure for the day. Scalar multiplication, we can multiply a matrix by a constant by multiplying each element by that constant. And that's your printable, and we already have that. I think what I want to do is take our graphers, and I think what I want to do is do our matrix addition on the graphing calculator so that we know how to do this. So everybody, let's go ahead and get our graphing calculators, and I'll turn mine on as well. So that we'll be all set to go for next class period. So let's go ahead and take a look at our company A and company B. Everybody, to set up matrix A, we're going to use the matrix editor. So everybody in your grapher, let's go ahead and find the matrix editor here. You can see that is second 
x to the negative 1 button. That is, ready? Row 4, column 1. Ooh, rectangular arrangement, just like a matrix. So row 4, column 1, everybody find it. Second inverse is the matrix editor. Everybody please find it. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the, um, the matrix, right, A, and we're going to edit it. And so everybody go to matrix A, and we're going to edit it. So second inverse is matrix, right arrow over to edit, and select matrix A. In matrix A, it asks us for the dimensions. What dimensions would we like for matrix A? Well, we see from our data that matrix A is a not 3 by 3, but what? 2 by 3. And so we're going to tell the calculator we want a 2 by 3 matrix. So I want 2 by 3. Now I'm going to enter, I'm going to enter my entries from left to right in order and pressing enter and I'll move from left to right. So 12, 15, 7, and it'll automatically jump down after I press enter. It'll automatically keep jumping down to the next entry. Now I'm at matrix A, row 2, column 1. That was 1, 7, and 1. So we've gone ahead and we've constructed matrix A in my matrix editor. Once again, that's row 4, column 1, second inverse is my matrix editor. Everybody, go ahead and make matrix B at this time. So do matrix B on your own. So I'll do second inverse, and I want to edit matrix B now. In matrix B, I'm going to select, and I'm going to change its dimensions. We want dimensions 2 by 3. Let's go ahead and put our entries for matrix B. Our entries in order were 28, 33, 125. Row 2, column 1 is 3, 5, 9. Take a minute and make sure you have matrix B correctly entered. Did I do it right? Awesome. So where's the big payoff? Home screen, baby. We're going to go ahead and perform matrix addition and verify what we got algebraically. Now, would we need to create matrices to that addition? No. But when we do multiplication with our solving next time, using the calculator is going to be much easier. So everybody, let's go ahead and verify now our company C merger that we already did algebraically by using the matrix editor. So here we go. We want to do what? A plus B. I want to do A plus B. So on my regular home screen, second quit, I'm going to call up the matrix named A. I go to the same menu, that second inverse is matrix, but now I want names. So I don't go to edit it, I've already created it, I just select it, the matrix named A, and what operation do I want? Plus, so I just select my gray operation key plus the matrix named B, you guessed it. Second inverse is the matrix, scroll down to M, I'm sorry, scroll down to matrix that's named B, enter. And I get A plus B on my home screen. Everybody see it? That's pretty bomb. Now I'll go ahead and press enter. Voila! Look at that. It spits out a 2 by 3 matrix that has the corresponding <coughs> elements we've already done algebraically. Now, that's not a big wow factor because we could easily add those numbers together. But when we use inverse matrices to solve systems next class, you guys already know how to use your editor, and so that's pretty cool. What questions do you have about that matrix editing feature? We'll need that next time along with your dimensions. Great, now let's go to your closures. Great work, you guys. Now we'll be ahead of the game next time. All right, so here we are for our closure. What are the dimensions of the following matrix? Don't call out. Everybody think, what are the dimensions? Get ready. Maya. Two by three. Two by three, good job, thank you. Two by three matrix because there's two rows by three columns. Is the What is the row two, column three entry? Everybody get ready, don't call out. Tell the class when I call your name. What's the row two, column three entry? Cody slash prize winner? Four. Four is absolutely right. Raise your hand if you're gonna say four. Four, yes indeed. Don't call out. What are the dimensions of this matrix? Get ready. Blake. Four by five. Four by five. Raise your hand if you have four by five. We're going to say it, but I didn't call you, but I'm going to call you next time. Good. Four by five. 
What row column is the element negative 13? So what row column is the element negative 13? Everybody find it. Hans? Uh, fourth row, second column. Fourth row, second column. So it's the four comma two entry. Absolutely. Good job. Please add the following matrices if possible. So let's go ahead and take a look on your closure sheet. It looks like two by two plus a two by two, the same dimensions. I can add this without having to go through my editor. Be ready to show your entries of the class in order, left to right. Go ahead and add the following matrices, number one, number two, if possible. All right, what did you get for your entries in that first one? Andrew? Um, 7, 7, 16, 3. 7, 7, 16, 3. Raise your hand if you have the same as Andrew. Yes, yes, yes. Good job. Awesome work. What did you get for the second, the second edition problem? What did you get for the second edition problem? Nathan? Well, not possible. Not possible. How come? Got you. So this is not possible because the dimensions don't match. We need to have the same the same dimensions in order to add or subtract matrices. So not possible. Dimensions don't match. Thank you. Uh oh, math. No math in class. <laughs> Unless it's math class. And awesome! You guys did great and we're ahead of the game because we already got to see the matrix editor which is setting up great for solving equations, systems of equations using the matrix as well. So the rest of the time it will be yours to work quietly. I'm going to upload this to our Moodle site. It